assemble. I miss the mall. I think you saw the two notes we said. A warm welcome to all of you, lovers of New York City and its history, gathered today to honor and celebrate the life and work of Mayor John Peroy Mitchell at his former home here at 258 Riverside Drive in Manhattan. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel, Chair of the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center and of the New York City Landmarks 50 Alliance, a committee of more than 183 distinguished individuals and organizations who are committed to informing the public about the past, present, and future of New York City. To begin with, our thanks to resident Jonathan Kagan, without whom we would not be here. He first nominated Mayor Mitchell for a cultural medallion, and our thanks as well to Edward Powers, the board president, as well as the other residents of this historic building. John Froy Mitchell was born in the Bronx to a fire marshal and a school teacher. He's known as the boy mayor for his youth. When he was elected, he was 34 years old, the youngest mayor ever to serve in New York to this day, and I would assume going forward as well. He has also been called by some the first Latino mayor. His great-grandfather emigrated from Spain to Venezuela at the end of the 18th century. And although his grandfather was an American citizen, he was born in Venezuela and served as the Venezuelan consul in the United States for many years. Mitchell himself attended Fordham Prep School, was graduated from Columbia College in 1899 and from New York Law School with honors in 1902. His foray into politics began when four years later he was hired by family friend William Ellison, who was the New York City Corporation Council at the time. William Ellison asked him to investigate the Manhattan Borough President, John Ahern, for incompetence, waste, and inefficiency. We would use the exact opposite to describe our current Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, a model of civic concern and efficiency. After Mitchell's investigation, it led to the dismissal of Ahern. As a result, Mitchell continued his work for the city investigation departments, and he gained recognition for his thoroughness and professionalism. And during that process, he burnished his reputation as a reformer. In 1909, he was elected president of the now defunct Board of Aldermen. And in 1910, he served for six weeks as acting mayor, when the then mayor, William Gaynor, was injured by a bullet. Mitchell was known as a reformist leader, and at the age of 34, he was elected in a landslide victory on a progressive platform with a promise to modernize the city and its bureaucracy. However, his early popularity waned when he began to implement austere fiscal policies, along with his unique vision for public education, he attempted to reduce the size of the Board of Education and lower teachers' salaries. Not a good formula. Along with his advocacy for combining vocational and academic coursework. Perhaps more importantly, for universal military preparation for war, which alienate him, alienated him from many New Yorkers and cost him the Republican nomination in 1917. 
Despite this setback, Mitchell ran as a pro-war fusion candidate with the theme of patriotism and nationalism. That message was vigorously rejected by voters who in about face overwhelmingly elected John Hyland, a Tammany Hall Democrat. After his unsuccessful bid for the mayoralty, Mitchell followed his very firm patriotic principles. He enlisted in the Air Service as a cadet, obtaining the rank of major. During a tragic training accident on the morning of July 6, 1918, due to an unfastened seatbelt, Mitchell plummeted 500 feet from his plane and, of course, was killed. His body was brought back to New York City and, in deference to his service to this city, was paraded from City Hall through Washington Arch and up to St. Patrick's Cathedral. Today, we, and especially today, we still recognize Mitchell's important contribution to New York City. His waste cut cutting measures, his standardization of work and salary requirements for municipal employees, his creation of the first zoning plan for city development in the United States, and his appointment of the first woman to head a major city agency. He chose the progressive social reformer, Catherine Davis, who was appointed corrections commissioner on January 1st, 1914. All these progressive achievements have endowed his brief life and public service with significance a century later, and that's why we are here today. And now for our program of distinguished speakers. Robert J. D'Alessandro, an American historian, please come forward. Robert J. D'Alessandro, an American historian and author who has written and presented extensively on the American Expeditionary Forces contribution to the First World War. A retired colonel in the United States Army, currently Deputy Secretary of the American Battle Monuments Commission and the current director of the United States Army Centi Center of Military History at Fort McNair in Washington. Mr. D'Alessandro, or should I call you Colonel? Or Rob Secretary, is good enough. <laughs> is co-author of the organization and insignia of the American Expeditionary Forces from 1917 to 1923 which received the Army Historical Foundation Award for Excellence in Writing. He currently serves as chair of the United States World War I Centennial Commission that you will be hearing a great deal about in the years ahead. It is a pleasure to introduce you, Rob Dallison. Thank you, thank you. Well, I have to tell you, it's really a pleasure to be here in New York rather than back in Washington. Uh, I think the madness has touched every facet of the government, and it's nice to take a little respite for a couple hours to come up here to a beautiful part of New York City. And uh, I can't thank Barbara Lee enough for having us up here. It's so nice to be a part of this magnificent event. and allowing me just a couple minutes to talk to you not about the mayor because I'm smart enough not to talk about something there are so many people here that know so much more about but I'll talk to you about some things that were touched on on the earlier part of this program which is reform and a progressive era and how this is important in our life today so let me start by saying as chairman of the World War One Centennial Commission our commission has two major functions. Education. Because way, way too many Americans have no or little understanding of the importance of the Great War 
and of its role and how it impacts us today in the 21st century. And this is particularly important because of the people that have very little understanding of that war, it's younger Americans that don't understand the war, and those are the people we need to target. This war was important to us in so many ways. At the beginning of the war, the United States was an agrarian, debtor nation, inward looking, and it was a slight military power. In fact, our army ranked just below that of Romania in military might. In the spirit of the then popular song though, how do you keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris, Americans after the war saw themselves as active participants for the good in world affairs. After the war, the service of African Americans, immigrants, women, working in the military, in industry at home, and providing humanitarian service abroad, Kindle was the kindling that sparked the civil rights movement and the progressive movement. Here's an interesting fact. In New York, they provided more than 10% of the American Expeditionary Force, more than any other state of the Union. And these soldiers served in most, some of the most storied units to participate in the First World War. You've heard them all. The Fighting 69th, the Harlem Hellfighters, or Rattlers, the 77th Metropolitan Division, and particularly its Lost Battalion. That's just to name a few. So many more units served at the front. We're here today to celebrate the accomplishments of Mayor Mitchell and to remember his generation and that generation's work as reformers. His story is our story and we need everyone here, those interested as active partners in preserving that story. Our country, our citizens, the world need to hear about Mayor Mitchell's service, and the service of over 4.7 other Americans in this great war. Today's young people need to hear about the 400,000 New Yorkers who served in World War I. Why? Because it's vitally important that we understand how this war shaped the nation we live in today. And yet, that's my point. Few Americans do. They don't understand how the war impacts us. Now, we have an ambitious multi-year program aimed at those Americans, at the American particular, at public and particularly in our youth. And in partnership with the History Channel, the National World War I Museum in Kansas City, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library in Chicago, we've outlined a comprehensive educational plan that will reach more than 10 million students this year and growing. Middle and high school students, along with broader programs available to the public at large. Now that's our first mission. Our second mission is commemoration to remember and honor this forgotten generation. They not only served his heroically to help win the war, but when they came home, they were the parents, the mothers and fathers of the greatest generation. Congress authorized the Centennial Commission to establish a national World War I memorial on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. This memorial will figuratively stand side by side with the World War I Memorial in Kansas City, the Liberty Memorial, and literally with the other memorials on the National Mall to the three other great wars of the 20th century. And like so many of our recent memorials that pay tribute to the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine, and Coast Guardsmen, and the American public at large, we receive no public funding for our authorization. A memorial project like this and all the Commission's work is only possible through concerned citizens, through groups like you, and we need you. So what I'd like to tell you is, get involved. A state chapter is forming now in New York City, along with a city chapter. So drop by our website, WorldWar1CentennialCommission.com, that's a, a dot .org, that's a one, and get involved. The cost of World War I was high, 
more than 160,000 Americans died in the war, excluding the flu, more than Korea and Vietnam combined. And given our involvement in this war, we must embrace this moment to recognize the World War I generation. It is our task to ensure this generation is not forgotten. It is our mission to provide a voice to Americans who can no longer speak, and in doing so, send a powerful message to the present generation that their service to their nation, their state, or their community will never be forgotten. Thank you so much. I've suggested to Rob that he pass a paper around, and anyone who's interested. Oh, sorry. Who's interested? Is this still working, Brett? Um, in, in being either informed or involved, just sign your name. And he promises you he won't ask you for money. I won't ask you. I'll do that. Um, well, it is still off the record. While I was seated there, I noticed the name of this building that I was not aware of until I was seated there. And it is called the Peter Stuyvesant. Do you know how it got that name? The sister building was called the Hedrick uh, Hudson, so I think it was just the... Uh... Well, I think they got the luck of the draw because of my other things. We are particularly interested in the role of Stuyvesant. Yes, but he, the, actually, your namesake mayor was known as irascible for a reason. But we'll save that for another time and place. In fact, I'll invite you now to that other time and place. It is October 10th, when the 70th anniversary of the Bound House Museum will be commemorated. The Bound House is a little known, modest wood frame house in Flushing, Queens. And it is really the birthplace of religious freedom and freedom of conscience, a subject that is as timely now, or maybe more so, than it was then. So if you want to hear more, come to the Bound House commemoration on no, October 10th. But now to go on with our program of wonderful speakers. Anya Schifrin Stiglitz, who lives here as well, is acting director of the International Media, is now director, sorry. Glad to always to hear promotions, and especially where they're so richly deserved, of the International Media and Communications Program, referred to as IMC, and an adjunct professor in the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. She also serves as director of journalism training programs at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, was a founder of journalists, journalismtraining.net and is a member of the advisory board of the Center for Media, Data, and Society at Central European University. Ms. Schifrin was a former business journalist. She was editor-in-chief of the Istanbul-based daily newspaper, The Turkish Times, and has written for many other publications. It's a pleasure to welcome you to your own building. Thank you very this much. Program. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And also, I'd like to acknowledge the Kagans, who I think did all, did all the a lot of the work on this um, event. As I keep telling people in the elevator, um, I think that I was invited not just because I teach at Columbia, but because I've lived in the neighborhood for 52 years. And um, indeed, my mom is still in the apartment where I grew up on, on West 94th Street. So I know, in fact, how few plaques we have in this area, especially it seems like compared to London, where almost every block house seems to have a plaque. We don't really make a fuss of ourselves on the shabby Upper West Side. It's not really our style. In fact, in my mom's building, there was a move to change the building's name to the Stanton because of Elizabeth Cady Stanton having lived in a building on that location. And my mom was quoted in the New Yorker more or less saying, what's the fuss? So like wondering what the fuss was, I did 
what any good New Yorker would do. I went down to the Strand Bookstore and sent my researcher to Columbia Library and started finding out about the mayor. I wanted to know whether Mayor Mitchell was a suitable Upper West Sider and, and what he was like. And of course, the first thing everyone knows about him is Sam Roberts' piece about how he accidentally shot someone on Riverside Drive because he always carried a gun because of an assassination attempt on his life. And I thought, well, that doesn't really seem like an Upper West Sider. We don't tend to carry guns and shoot people on Riverside Drive. I learned a bit about the neighborhood, that there were tennis courts on 95th and 96th and West End, but I don't know whether the mayor played tennis there, that when we think back to what New York was like in that time period, just a few years before, there were about almost two to three million people living in New York, um, in Manhattan. The Lower East Side was one of the most densely populated places in the world. It was packed out. And the subway was transformative because it moved people to other neighborhoods in the city. But even so, the architects who designed this area and planned for the Upper West Side were disappointed that it never really became as posh as they had hoped. We, I, we went through some of the Columbia papers and saw and that he was actually, he's still discussed in some of the American history seminars there and has been written about by our some alumni. We found some wonderful quotes from his classmates. He surely did not impress me as studious, rather as a brilliant fellow who learned easily and was more intent on having a good time than standing at the head of his class. I should say he got along more than commonly well with less than commonly effort. He loved to fence, excelled at debating, and went a lot to the theater, but he was not a big reader. Oftentimes a poor book would do him just as well as a good one. Finally I found he would rather have given up office than stop dancing. Apparently it was a great book. Get about. We also found some wonderful letters from his mother telling her how much she telling him how much she loved him and saying she was going to give away his baby clothes to the poor little French and Belgian children. But even though his Columbia classmates may have felt he wasn't intellectual enough, when he ran for mayor, they backed his candidacy. And the class of 99 uh, printed a letter in 1913 in the alumni letter saying that we think he, his public record has shown him to possess those qualities of earnestness and forcefulness and honesty, which are his traits, uh, which are, and they're characteristic traits, and we have faith in his ability to fight against corruption. Um, I turn now to Ty Jones, whose 2012 PhD thesis about the mayor was published into a book called Mal More Powerful Than Dynamite. And it's a fascinating work because the parallels with today are so extraordinary. We all remember the weather people blowing up a building in the Greenwich Village in the 70s. Well, the same thing happened. The anarchists actually blew up a building in, West, in East Harlem around this time. Um, New York had a homeless population of about 30,000 people to a pop, compared to a, in a city of 5 million, so that puts them on par with today. Um, Mitchell was very aware of these problems. He tried to expand the city bureaucracy and sort of create a government that could help handle some of them. The, at one point during the snowstorm in the winter, I think it was 2013, Mitchell was stranded upstate in the snow, and the international workers of the world took more than 100 homeless and unemployed people and visited different churches every single night in New York City, saying either, you know, give us food and shelter, or give us money for a hotel. After several nights, the whole city was in sort of turmoil. This may remind you of Occupy and Furious. The 1% uh, the was very, very angry about this. And the deputy mayor cracked down. But when Mitchell came back, he fired his commissioner of police and appointed a new one. So I think in some ways, the times are similar to today. And he does indeed sound like a very modern and very Upper West Side kind of mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you for your illuminating remarks. And uh, I admire your burst of chauvinism, but I think the Upper West Side now is the locale, to put it in your economic terms, the most expensive building that we have, not only in New York, but in the United States. I forgot to say that he started every morning with a breakfast meeting in this building. <laughs> well, you were so detailed. What did he have for breakfast? It's part of his council of breakfast. Because he never lived in Gracie Mansion.
Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Peter Van Alphen. He is the Margaret Thompson Associate Curator of Greek Coins at the American Numismatic Society, an economic historian. He has published works on a variety of topics, including Mycenaean administration, Athenian public finance, and coinage, Arab monetization, late Ro Roman amphoras, and has curated exhibitions and published on medals relating to the Olympics, to World's Fairs, to ophthalmology, how did that get in there? Um, optics, and the First World War. He is director of the Society's Newman Summer Graduate Seminar and an adjunct professor in the Classics Department at New York University. He has recently been awarded membership at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and a Loeb Classical Library Foundation Fellowship from Harvard University. Welcome, Dr. Van Allen. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara Lee. It's been nearly 75 years since John Pori Mitchell was last commemorated by a plaque of this sort in his own city. The spectacular rise and equally spectacular fall of his political career might not have warranted commemoration if not for the fact that the boy mayor stood and died by his convictions and so inspired a well-connected circle of friends to memorialize him. The connections are fascinating, all the more so for their numismatic component, something which is obviously of interest to me. Mitchell lost re-election in the hugely contentious 1917 mayoral elections by a landslide, nearly the equal of the landslide victory that propelled him into office four years earlier. His loss of popularity had as much to do with overreaching in his attempts to reform Tammany Hall, the police, and education, as we heard earlier from Barbara, as it did with his ardent patriotic support for the United States' involvement in the Great War in Europe, which had begun a year after he took office. Mitchell's 1917 campaign was pol polarizing, questioning the loyalty of the teeming German and Irish immigrant populations in the city. But here he was simply echoing the growing chorus, led in part by former U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt, who had long wanted the U.S. to join the fight on the side of Britain and who at the same time wanted immigrant populations throughout the country to drop their hyphens and become fully Americanized. A call that grew stronger after the sinking of the British passenger liner Lusitania by a German U-boat in May 1915. A ship that had left New York City with scores of American passengers, most of whom did not survive. In the run-up to the 1917 election, Roosevelt in fact stated that support for Mitchell was a duty to the nation and would hearten true Americans in the war crisis. Mitchell lost nonetheless and subsequently put his money where his mouth was, so to speak, and joined the U.S. Army Air Service. And he died in training a few months later at the age of 38. Mitchell was first memorialized by his classmates at Columbia soon after the war ended. The class of 1899 commissioned a large bronze tablet from one of their own, sculpture, sculpture Do, Joe Davidson, a close friend of Mitchell's. This tablet hangs on the west side of Hamilton Hall, not that far from here, and depicts Mitchell seated in his army uniform, gazing upon a text that recounts his accomplishments. Just prior to the start of the war, Davidson had been an apprentice to Herman Atkins McNeil, a New York City-based sculptor who designed a new quarter dollar coin for the U.S. that was unveiled in 1917. This coin, in fact, was part of a larger coin beautification program launched by Theodore Roosevelt in his last years in office, which sought to produce for the United States coins of artistic merit equal to those then produced in Europe. Amazingly enough, the U.S. Mint still produces one of the coins of Roosevelt's program, the Lincoln Penny, so little loved today but enormously popular when introduced in 1909. Davidson was also a close friend of Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, founder of the Whitney Museum, and a sculptor herself. Her brother Alfred was tragically one of the Americans who had perished 
in the Lusitania sinking. During the war, she used her vast resources to support various charities for the Allied cause, but also created a series of small sculptures of soldiers, some of which served as models for her greater than life-size monument to World War I servicemen, which was unveiled on Memorial Day 1922 in the newly named Mitchell Square Park, located at Broadway and 167th Street. A flagstaff in Mitchell's memory was also dedicated at the park in 1941, the same year that the two flagstaffs in front of the New York Public Library at 42nd Street were dedicated to him as well. However, best known among Mitchell's memorials is the one located at Engineers Gate on the east side of Central Park at 90th Street. Dedicated in 1928, 10 years after Mitchell's death, the memorial features a gilded bust of the mayor in the center of an elaborate granite stele, a composition that is at once both striking and unavoidable to anyone entering the park. The bust was sculpted by Adolf Alexander Weinmann, a German who had emigrated to New York City as a teenager in the 1880s. A prolific artist, Weinmann's sculptures can be found in virtually every corner of the city, but most notably on Manhattan Municipal Building, built between 1907 and 1914 at the east end of Chambers Street. The famed architects McKim, Mead, and White designed the building and commissioned Weinman to produce the sculptural decorations, including the massive golden statue, Civic Fame, which is perched at the very top. In numismatic circles, Weinman is also known as the man responsible for two of the most beautiful coins ever produced in this country, the so-called Mercury Head Dime and Walking Liberty Half Dollar, both of which were introduced in 1916. Unless you think the numismatic connections in there, we are gathered here today in no small part due to the efforts of a prominent academic numismatist, Jonathan Kagan, a resident of this building whose keen interest in history generally led to the discovery that both he and the boy mayor had at one time or another lived under the same roof. Thank you. While you're giving credit, please do not forget the director of the American Numismatic Society that coincidentally shares the apartment with Mr. Kagan, his wife, who is the director. Thank you. For 10 years, since 2005, award-winning author and journalist Sam Roberts has been the New York Times urban affairs correspondent. He's also the host of the New York one week hour long interview program called Close Up. But before joining the Times, Sam Roberts worked at the Daily News for 15 years, first as a reporter, then as city editor, and as Is that okay? And uh, thank you. Just turn it over in case it's still working. Before joining the Times, he worked at the Daily News for 15 years, first as a reporter, then city editor, and as political reporter, political editor. Mr. Roberts has won awards from the Society of Silurians the Newspaper Guild of New York, and the Peter Kiss Award from the Fund for the City of New York, among others. His most recent book, published not so very long ago in 2014, it's entitled, A History of New York in 101 Objects. It has been referred to as the Rosetta Stone of New York identity. And Mr. Roberts is thought of quite appropriately as the cultural historian of New York. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Barbara Lee, and thanks to all of you for coming. What do mayors get remembered for? Wallace Sayer and Herbert Kaufman, who wrote the seminal book on governing New York, said that while the presidency can elevate average people, uh, the mayoralty is the highly vulnerable symbol of all 
the defects in the city and the government. Well, take John Peroy Mitchell. He was, as Barbara Lee said, distinguished by being the youngest mayor since consolidation. He had a headache the day he was inaugurated. The Evening World described the ceremony as the most cheerless day ever known at City Hall. He did pack a pistol. That shooting incident occurred right here on the steps of this building. He was denied renomination and re-election. There's not that much to remember him by, as we just heard. The bronze plaque at Columbia, the square at St. Nicholas Avenue, the base of the flagpoles in front of the public library. Uh, Mitchell Place uh, on the east side is not named after Mayor, Mayor Mitchell. And in fact, he may be most famous for having fallen out of that plane without a seatbelt. Uh, one measure, though, of how he rated compared to his successor, the Tammany stalwart Mayor Hyland, is that after Hyland left office, he was named to the children's court by his successor, Mayor Jimmy Walker. Uh, and Jimmy Walker said of Mayor Hyland, the appointment of Judge Hyland means that the children can now be judged by their peer. <laughs> when Mayor uh, Mitchell died in 1918. The Times wrote, the memory of the best of our public servants in local administration tends to grow dim. And of course, Mitchell was considered among the best. He fought police corruption. As Barbara Lee said uh, and others pointed out, he did institute the first zoning guidelines for development. He appointed the first woman to lead a major municipal agency. Oswald Garrison Villard in The Nation said he was the ablest and best mayor New York ever had. Teddy Roosevelt said he has given us nearly an ideal administration of New York City government as I have ever seen in my lifetime. And Sarah and Kaufman wrote that he ranked second only to LaGuardia by all the criteria of performance. Mitchell's administration, the Times wrote when he died, was too good, too intelligent. It had stepped on too many prejudices, privileges, and corruptions. It was too civilized for a city brought up on the old political and party gospel of the pocket and the trough. His administration fell but it will long be honorably remembered and regretted. Well, thanks to Barbara Lee and all of you, it will be remembered a bit longer because of what you did today. Thanks again. Thank you, Sam. Um, I would like to ask Jonathan Kuhn, the curator of all of the Mitchell Memorials that you heard described today. His official title is Director of Antiquities at the Parks Department. He told us earlier today, as we were talking about World War I, there are 122 memorials to World War I in the New York City parks. But I'll ask him now to tell us about all the memorials to John Peroy Mitchell, and you might even evaluate them. Thank you. Well, the, uh, the thing that happens when you're the last speaker is everybody said what you were going to say when uh, <laughs> you, you get up, which maybe it means I'll keep it brief. Uh, I'm largely here as a ceremonial and ceremonial aspect and so I bring you a greetings on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio and Parks Commissioner Mitchell with two L's silver and um, we I noticed yesterday on our website we had Mitchell Square misspelled uh, uh, with two L's uh, we will uh, correct that I think uh, uh, to respond to some of the comments rather than make the comments I planned on giving 
the comments about World War One first, uh, and what Barbara Lee just mentioned. We have about 800 official monuments in our park system, and 122 of them, one out of every seven or so, is dedicated to uh, those who served and lost their lives in World War One. They're in every precinct of the city, in every neighborhood. We have nine doughboys, such as the Abington Square doughboy, and we have. Uh, 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 numerous other monuments. I'm proud to say that of the 122, only one is in need of restoration. It's in storage. It's the Highbridge Doughboy. We want to put it back, and I seek help uh, 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 to do so. Uh, we've just opened the Highbridge that connects Manhattan and uh, the Bronx and University Heights, and uh, that's the only sculpture that we've not restored in recent years. Uh, five years ago, we restored the Prospect Park War Memorial, which honors all those who lost their lives in Brooklyn. And I kept pointing out to people at the time that there are more people, New Yorkers, who died and listed on that monument than died in 9-11. And that when we think about the resources that have been given to Ground Zero and to the commemoration of Ground Zero and how few people know the story of those who lost their lives a century ago, working class, often immigrants from around the city, uh, it's really rather poignant to consider the role you have as the Centennial Commission to sort of revive this notion of, of remembrance uh, over generations when there's no longer any living connection to those events. Uh, just a few details to fill in on the monuments, since much is already said by our uh, scholar from the Numismatic Society and others. Um, we do have two monuments and a park named for Mitchell. Um, with the monument in Central Park, known best to the joggers entering at Engineers Gate, uh, I'm not sure the architect's names were mentioned, but it's Thomas Hastings and Don, with two ends, uh, 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 a boy uh, uh, who uh, worked with uh, uh, Hastings. We have across the street, essentially, at 98th Street, the Career Memorial Staircase, which Hastings also designed uh, upon the accidental death in a car accident of his partner, Career, who designed, of course, many important buildings in New York. The Flagstaffs, both at Mitchell Square and at the Public Library, have confused me a little bit about their uh, provenance, shall we say, and I've been trying to sort this out in the last 24 hours. Uh, and uh, it seems that their lovely ornamental bases were made before Mitchell died, uh, uh, considerably before, about six years before, just after the library was built. There was a consortium of uh, Italian artisans who were commissioned. And if you look up closely, there are these beautiful bronze decorative sculptural elements, and they reference civilization, navigation, discovery, and conquest. Uh, and they were there already. And they had two large wooden poles, very tall, 85 feet tall, each of them. Uh, and then when Mitchell died, they kind of conveniently, uh, well, they created a fund to create a memorial to him, but it never was spent, as far as I can tell, uh, until 1941, when they renovated the plaza in front of the public library, and the, one of the wooden poles had fallen over in a, in a storm, and only one was still standing. They took that one wooden pole and they shipped it up to Mitchell Square. They replaced them with steel poles, and then they put the plaques in the ground. The one at the northern end refers to his service to city, and the one at the southern end refers to his services to the, his country. And it said in the Parks Department uh, press release of 1941, which is on our website, by the way, uh, that they fly, they would fly the city flag on the northern pole and the national the nation's flag on the southern pole. And I, bike by on my way home after seeing the Pope at 60th and 5th Avenue on Friday and uh, accidentally. Uh, and uh, then looked in the ground and looked up too and the plaques are still there, they're just fine and the, uh, the flags are still being flown, I'm pleased to say, representing his city, to serve, his service to city and his service to country. Uh, those poles were actually replaced again only about seven years ago in a renovation uh, that uh, entailed both the bronzes at the base and, the, uh, and so forth. Uh, and the uh, replacement, actually, of the poles themselves again. Uh, lastly, I would say I've been a little confused about the references to, uh, and maybe I'm going to stir it up with my final comment, the reference to uh, uh, Mitchell as the youngest mayor. I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, the youngest mayor of consolidated New York. Uh, there was one other mayor who was younger, and that uh, he was elected in 1890. Uh, the city hadn't been consolidated yet, and his name was Hugh Grant. Uh, and we have a park circle in the Bronx named for him, and you can come see that. Thank you. Actually, our ever alert historian, Sam Roberts, pointed that out, that it was the consolidated city. 
like Hugh Grant, we've been noticing him lately. Um, thank you all for coming to this brief but worthwhile ceremony um, so that you know these proceedings have been videotaped and you will be able to see the program on the Duke University website of the David Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library of Duke University. Uh, it's actually my archive, but it can be seen on that archive on YouTube and iTunes U. And to my surprise and delight, more people than I ever imagined do view things and are in touch with us. So I hope you'll take a moment to view yourselves, your neighbors and friends here. But now it is a pleasure to dedicate this cultural medallion. Can you, Mr. Undermeyer, the new Deputy Director of the Historic Districts Council, will take the paper off. And Deborah Burchad will come forward, please, and read the text as we dedicate this cultural medallion to the 95th mayor of the city of New York, John Troy Mitchell. John Peroy Mitchell, July 19th, 1879 to July 6th, 1918, 258 Riverside Drive, Manhattan. John Peroy Mitchell, often called the boy mayor, he was 34 when he elected, lived here while in office, 1914 to 1917. His family emigrated from Spain to Venezuela and then to New York. Although a U.S. citizen, his grandfather served as a Venezuelan consul to the U.S. for many years. A graduate of Fordham Preparatory School, Columbia University, and New York Law School, Mitchell was born in the Bronx. He was a staunch opponent of Tammany Hall. In 1909, after leading investigations into municipal corruption, he was elected president of the Board of Aldermen, and then, in 1913, was elected mayor. He promoted professionalism in government, created the first zoning plan in the U.S., and appointed the first woman to head a major city agency. Filled with wartime fervor, his failed campaign for a second term was an appeal to militarism and nationalism. After his re-election bid failed, Mitchell enlisted in the Army Air Service during World War I and died in a tragic training accident in Louisiana. Do a countdown. One, two, three. This beautifully kept building is now adorned by this cultural medallion. And as Anya Schifrin commented, there are medallions all over the world, but what about New York? And that's why this program started. It will be celebrating its 20th anniversary in May of 2016. And we invite each and all of you to recommend a worthy, appropriate, provable resident of a building. Uh, do we have forms to hand out? No, but they can visit the website. If you will visit our website at www.hlpcculturalmedallions.org. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, guests. Thank you, 258 Riverside Drive. All of you for joining us today for celebrating the life and work of John Peroy Mitchell. But before we go, I just realized we have dedicated medallions to former Nobel Prize winners, but we have rarely had a Nobel Prize winner in our audience, who coincidentally is a resident of this building too. Welcome to you, Joseph Stiglitz. I wonder if there is any word economic, social, cultural, or otherwise, you would like to add to our ceremony. Okay. So, uh, Anya, in in doing research on on uh, the uh, former mayor, uh, got it. Uh, I learned a lot 
about uh, New York history, and uh, that's the way I do most of my research. And uh, I think it was quite remarkable the battles on inequality that he fought, uh, and the similarity to those battles that we fight today. And uh, uh, it was. Uh, that period in which he was the mayor uh, was really a transformative period in New York City's history. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, what is going on now will be another transformative period in our history. Thank you.